Hello, and welcome to the Newberry Report, where grown women read children's books and argue about them. On today's episode, Bud Not Buddy by Christopher Paul Curtis. Hello, and welcome to the New Berry Report. New decade! Woo! Season two! Oh my gosh, Carolyn Burns, what a long time it has been since season one. It's been 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> it has. Yeah. We've moved right from 1979 and decided that our next decade will be the 2000s. Woo! Because it's as contemporary as we could get, but over. Yeah. That's a bad way of saying that. What were you going to say? Well, you know, it's the it's the most recent completed decade. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, it's more accurate than yours. A hundred percent accurate and succinct. Yeah, it's great. We are reading the two thousand award winner "Bed Not Buddy" by Christopher Paul Curtis. Uh, it is a winner of both the Newbery Medal and the Coretta Scott King Award. Ooh. So it's a two-time medaler. Ah. So let's start by reading the back of the book, shall we? Oh, of course. We have the same book, I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, listeners cannot see, but uh, rest assured, I'm not lying. We have the same edition. So um, why don't you go for it? All right. So this is the back of the book. It's 1936 in Flint, Michigan. Times may be hard, and 10-year-old Bud may be a motherless boy on the run, but Bud's got a few things going for him. Number one, he has his own suitcase full of special things. Number two, he's the author of Bud Caldwell's Rules and Things for Having a Funner Life and Making a Better Liar Out of Yourself. Number three, his mama never told him who his father was, but she left a clue— Flyers advertising Herman E. Calloway and his famous band, the Dusky Devastators of the Depression! Six exclamation points. Six exclamation points. Mm -hmm. Bud's got an idea that those flyers will lead him to his father. Once he decides to hit the road and find this mystery man, nothing can stop him. Not hunger, not fear, not vampires, not even Herman E. Calloway himself. Gotta watch out for those vampires. I read the back of the book before... I read this book, and you know I don't always do that. And I was like, vampires? <laughs> <laughs> and boy, was I excited when we got to that part of the book. What a wonderful twist. There uh, are several. Or there's, not several. There's a couple of vampires in this. That's true. But uh, thinking Lefty was a vampire was definitely yeah. a highlight for me. Uh, I, I actually really liked the afterword. Normally, like, I, I think we've talked about this before, like, epilogues are usually like, no, just cut, just cut it. Like, you didn't put it in the story originally. There was probably a reason. Mm-hmm. Trim the fat, get rid of it. But this one was, like, the sweetest note I'd ever read. And it ends with, be smarter than I was. Go talk to grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, and other relatives and friends. Discover and remember what they have to say about what they learned growing up. By keeping their stories alive, you make them and yourself immortal. Hmm. Which leads into, I love this book. Oh, we're going right in. Carrie. What did you think? I really like this book. Oh, wow. Can we you agree? believe it? We agree <laughs> for once. This is momentous. <laughs> I think we both like the Westin game. Oh, that's true. Gosh, I love that book. Yeah, but this, this is a this is a big deal though. This is yeah. a great this is a great read. This is such a good book. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of embarrassing how obvious that should have been. It feels like children's literature gets more sophisticated as we go along and evolves as its own genre. A lot, I think, because of the buying power that suddenly gets wrapped up into, like, 10 to 16-year-olds. You know, that's, like, the demographic to get to want to buy stuff. So maybe that's part of it. But it's so good. It's so, so clever and so fun and so subtle. Can I say that? I don't know. It felt like a lot of it felt really nuancingly interesting. Mm. Nuancingly. <laughs> Nuancingly. A lot of the, the language. Because <laughs> it's from his perspective. We're in our bud, not buddy, it's POV. And there were some words that I like had to look up because I was like, is that just a word I don't know? <laughs> and I was like, no, it's just like his vernacular. <laughs> yeah. It's okay that you don't know all of the words in the human language. You're only a single human being. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that was my favorite when he calls people human, human beings. beans. Oh, so cute. I do think it's interesting that the very first book of our new and improved and updated decade is a period piece from the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> Which seems to be Christopher Paul Curtis's like MO. And then he wrote a sequel to Bud Not Buddy called The Mighty Miss Malono. It's on the book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> about it's a it's like a spin-off book. <laughs> Yeah, about a character that we meet briefly in in an, a, a memorable and interesting scene that he has in uh, Hooverville, yeah. the tent city, basically, that he stumbles across with his friend uh, Bugs. And he meets this girl, smooches her, <laughs> in quite possibly, like, the cutest first kiss descriptive scene I've ever read. She was gunning for it, though. Oh, she was ready. <laughs> May have been his first kiss. I don't know if it was hers. That's true. That's fair. <laughs> um, but and he wouldn't have told her. No. But she she just was this great character that just jumps off the page and she exists in that one bit of book and never to return again. And I love that uh, uh, the author just spun her off into her own entire novel. Yeah. I was kind of hoping that we would meet her again in seven years. Mm. You know, because she tells the, the story of the song Shenandoah, I think, that they're listening to. And... She says it's a beautiful song because they have to wait seven years, but they love each other the whole time. One of the things that I love about Bud is that he will imagine his... So Bud's mother has passed, Mm -hmm. uh, and he goes to a home, and um, they send him to a foster home, his third foster home, and it's awful. (laughs) It's like the most horrific scene, uh, which we can talk about in a second. But um, he goes on the lam, uh, is on the run, and he has this way of making himself fall asleep wherever he is by picturing his mom reading stories to him. And he says, I learned it was best to, to be asleep before mama finished the story because if she got done and I was still awake, she'd always tell me what the story was about. I never told mama, but it always ruined the fun of the story. Shucks, here I was thinking I was hearing something funny about a fox or a dog, and Mama spoiled it by telling me they were really lessons about not being greedy and not wishing for things you couldn't have. Uh, But anyway, then he starts to dream about a man with a giant fiddle, our Herman E. Calloway. And then the dream got a lot better. I turned away from where Herman E. Calloway was, and there stood Deza Malone. I told her, I really like your dimple. She laughed and said, See you in seven years. <laughs> Which is a really specific dream. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess we should talk about the hornet scene. <laughs> oh. The so entire upsetting. sequence. It's a whole chapter or it's a whole two chapters, I think, uh, where he is locked in the shed is terrifying from start to finish. It's the spookiest thing I've ever heard. And, and reading it as a full-fledged adult, I was like, if someone locked me in that shed, I would be just as scared as he was and see the same creepy things in the shadow that he does. It's incredible that he's not scarred for life based on this yeah. experience. And that he didn't die. I mean, that he, he breaks open a hornet's nest and he's locked in a shed with this very mad ne- broken nest of hornets. And he manages through, I don't know, I guess through the pure adrenaline to, like, shove himself through the window. So he cr- crashes, he breaks and then crashes through a window while being chased and stung by har- hornets. And then, like, continues to live his life. And other than a couple references to, like, oh, that what's that welt you got there, son? <laughs> There's no mention of the fact that he would be so messed up <laughs> based off of this experience. Oh my gosh. And apparently there are fish heads on the back of the door which are guarding the door uh, and he gets cut by one of them and then we find out later that it's like severely infected (laughs) and full of pus. Yes. The visuals in this scene are really great. I think from from like a narrative standpoint. I do love uh, one of the scenes that came into this this shed scene, which is the story of Bugs and the English-speaking cockroach. Oh. So there's a character of Bugs that he lives with at the home who gets a cockroach that crawls into Ugh. his ear canal. One of my biggest fears. Yes. It was on an episode of This American Life. Somebody had that happen to them. And that, it, it's horrible. And I guess it's like a commonly known thing that you have to drown out the cockroach because otherwise... 
bits of the cockroach will get like left in your ear, which I think is what happens to bugs too, right? Uh, like they're able to pull the legs off, but not the whole thing. Uh, yeah, it's too much. <laughs> I couldn't figure out sort of like what what this story was supposed to to mean in like a bigger way to have this character. Because even like the character of Bugs is so interesting. They tell this story of the cockroach that gets lodged in his ear and then starts screaming in English to this child uh, his own little cockroach fears of being trapped in this canal, which is just such a crazy experience. I was like, is the kid making it up? Does the kid actually think that that's what he heard? Like, he must have heard something and that he... So this comes up because Bud asks him later, like, mm-hmm. J- why were you screaming so much? And Bugs goes, oh, was I? I couldn't hear myself over the cockroach screaming, which was <laughs> so upsetting. I-, I suddenly went from, like, being terrified of it happening to myself to suddenly being like, oh, gosh. You have to, like, listen to a thing die and be terrified in your ear. I remember at the time being like, what is this story for? <laughs> Why are you telling me this other than like what an interesting way to to uh, introduce this character and r- explain why he has a certain nickname. But then we get to the shed scene and Bud is genuinely terrified of like sleeping on the ground for this very understandable reason of I knew a kid once that had a cockroach crawl in his ear. Yeah. That is – Terrify! It's it's like uh, we're going outside of like the fact that this is already a terrifying thing that's happening to him. To now he has to like take in this outside knowledge into this experience, and then also live with the fact that he's like a kid that still believes that the thing hanging from the ceiling is a vampire. <laughs> so he breaks through the window with a couple of hornets that t- got a ride on him out the window, <laughs> and then he goes into the house. Hides the shotgun. I was actually, like, legitimately a little nervous. So he goes into the house and he's like, i got to get revenge. I've got to get revenge. And his first thought is, like, where's the shotgun? And I Mm -hmm. was like, what is happening? And then I was like, it's a kid's book. Like, is he just going to put the shotgun with Todd and make it look like Todd did something bad? Like, is he just going to frame? And then he hides it. The only Just, reason he wanted it was to hide it so they couldn't use it. It's so smart. He's yeah. like, I've got to get out of here. I want to hide the weapon so that they can't shoot me as I'm running away. <laughs> and what what a terrible family. What an awful – I mean – it is one of those things like, you, you know, you hear these stories about like foster families that are just doing it for like the money or because they're low income and, and just need uh, to have that like support from the government or whatever. But it's it's so it's it never like makes it easier to hear it. Yeah. Although I, I've got to say, like, so we have this horrible experience that happens in the beginning of the book with the foster family, which is understandably dreadful and with the shed and all of that. After that, it it seems like every other human interaction he has after that is really positive. Yeah. He meets the people in Hooverville who immediately take him in, the lefty, that the, you know, the guy that literally drags him from the side of the road, the librarian who gives him food, the food line family that yeah. like invite him in to eat with them, the band at the end, like everyone he, it it kind of seems like he's having He's not having that hard of a time getting by in the world considering he's a 10-year-old boy with no family, no relatives, no friends of the family, no one, not even a home anymore or a, a, a common home. Um, and he's just like doing all right. Yeah, it is surprising. I was a little like, well, why aren't these people foster parents? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know it doesn't work like that. And I know the... Depression was oh, Great Depression was hard and that people had no way of knowing what they were going to be able to whether they could take care of their families, let alone other people's kids. But like mm-hmm. Mrs. Sleet sounds like the best person ever, <laughs> which I guess isn't that surprising because she's Lefty's kid. So uh, he's got a great generous sensibility about him. So it makes sense that he would have like passed that on to his kids. Yeah. And his job is it's very confusing. His job is being a porter on trains. Mm hmm. But he was bringing blood down. <laughs> I don't know if that was like a volunteer job. I the the afterward 
when she talks about the actual character that it was based on, it was like he was a porter or he was like a baseball player. Then he was a porter. Then he was like a paid driver. So I think like maybe he wasn't a porter anymore, but he still obviously had ties to the railroad industry. Yeah. I'm not reading too much into it. (laughs) I really... I really don't. I, it, it didn't take me out of the story. No, for to, sure. To be confused about what he does. <laughs> it's just like, how do you end up with all of that blood? I don't care yeah. narratively why he had that blood because the fact that he had it and then we get this wonderful reaction from Bud who thinks he is a vampire <laughs> because he has a cooler full of blood, tries to steal the car. And I'm assuming it is a stick shift because yeah. he immediately stalls 10 feet away and is not able to go forward is was so surprising to me. Like, I probably should have seen it coming, but I did not. And I was howling, like, with laughter just reading this on my own. It was <laughs> by far my favorite part of the book. I put my hands on the steering wheel and looked at the gear shift to try and figure out which was go. I stretched my legs as far as they'd reach and could just get the gas pedal. I pushed the gear down, and the car took off with a vampire running as hard as he could to catch me. Wow. If I kept this up, I would knock babyface Nelson off the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Chapter 11. The car only went 10 giant steps before it commenced to bucking and finally cut right off. (laughs) (laughs) And he tells him to roll the window down and he's like, what's this? (laughs) If I was a vampire, why have I got that sandwich and bottle of red pop? I thought for a second. And then the answer jumped out. Bait! (laughs) There's a vampire walking around with a cooler full of blood and sandwiches for bait. It's just such a great image. Uh, And then he said, but if I was a vampire, I wouldn't have to catch little boys. I'd just stick my fangs into one of those bottles and have my supper. Besides, where have you ever heard of a vampire that knew how to drive a car? That made sense. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. And has a sense of humor, right? I think he says that later. Mm -hmm. So the blood is in a cooler he gets he drinks the red pop and he's like, oh, he must have kept it on ice, which means that all of the food was in the same cooler as the blood. Because <laughs> I don't think we hear about another cooler. You know, Carrie, there's no OSHA back then. <laughs> there's no one's telling you you got to keep your biohazard waste away from <laughs> your lunch. <laughs> Hold that thought. We'll be right back. This episode of the Newberry Report is sponsored by Payfully. Renting your home or spare room can be a great way to earn some extra income, but actually getting paid can take months. That's where Payfully comes in. Payfully is a safe and secure way to get paid for your upcoming reservations within 24 hours of them being booked. Payfully deposits directly into your bank account with funds usually available the same day. It works with all the major platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway, and others, and they've helped thousands of hosts expand their business or cover unexpected expenses. Visit payfully.co, that's P-A-Y-F-U-L-L-Y dot C-O, for $20 off your first request with code NEWBERRY. That's payfully.co, promo code NEWBERRY, N-E-W-B-E-R-Y. If you're enjoying this show, you might also like some of the other podcasts on Race Car Radio. For instance, try London's New York. Your guide, Dan London, takes you on a deep and opinionated tour through some parts of New York City that are a little to the side of the usual tourist trail. And along the way, teaches you something about the extraordinary, rich, and diverse history of one of the greatest cities in the world. I guarantee you that it's a view of New York City that you've never had before. Listen and subscribe now to London's New York at racecarradio.com. And now, back to Bud Not Buddy. I love that Lefty starts this tradition of calling him Bud Not Buddy Mm -hmm. as like a name. When we get to uh, Lefty's daughter's house and we meet his grandkids, Scott and Kim, who are his favorite grandkids, but also his only grandkids. So they're also his least favorite grandkids. Mm -hmm. That's a joke my grandma makes all the time. (laughs) (laughs) My mom makes that joke about me. Yeah. I'm her favorite daughter. Yeah. I think this might be my favorite scene. So they're eating the pain cakes. (laughs) Because she's such a bad cook, apparently, 
that uh, she gives people <laughs> stomach pains, so they call them pain cakes instead of pancakes. <laughs> These two moments back to back. So he's left in the room with just Scott and Kim. Mm-hmm. But his experiences thus far with other kids have been mostly negative, particularly when he's like just shown up as a guest at their house. <laughs> so Bud has like lied to Lefty. I've always wondered if you could do this with a, a letter. So mm-hmm. Buddy is going from Flint, and he wants to go to Grand Rapids. Mm-hmm. So in, when he gets caught um, walking around at night in a town that's not supposed to be very friendly to black people, mm-hmm. he says he actually was coming from Grand Rapids so he would be brought back there. Smart kid. Right. And I always wondered if you could do that with a letter, but I feel like you can't. Like if you don't put a stamp on it, but you put the return address as the main address. It's supposed to work. But it might just be one of those, like, old wives' tales. <laughs> but how would they know? I don't know. Maybe it just goes to the dead letter office? Probably. I feel like they've probably been duped by that before. That now <laughs> they're smarter than this. They're like, there's no stamp at all. <laughs> <laughs> I see where this is going. <laughs> oh, other myth that this book made me think of was the um, the putting a hand of a sleeping kid in warm water and it making them pee. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. a myth. That's a real thing. Have you done it? I haven't. Oh. I, I learned that it had to be one hand in warm water and one hand in cold water. Mm. And something about the juxtaposition of those feelings made you pee. Hmm. Back to the cutest scene in the whole book. Oh, yes. <laughs> the little girl said, Scott, you talk too much. Let him sit down. Then she told me, Mama's going to bring the sausages in a minute. You like sausages? Uh-huh. I'd never had sausages before. <laughs> <laughs> but if that was what's making the house smell so good, I was going to love it. Kim said, good, because my grandpa brought them all the way from Grand Rapids. He always brings us good food, and we're going to share it with you because Mama says you're our special guest, and we have to treat you nice. Am I being nice? <laughs> Bud says back, so far. <laughs> and then she says, good, I'll make a deal with you. Uh-oh, Bud thinks. What kind of deal? I'll sing a song that I made up all by myself. When I'm done, I get to ask you one question, and you have to answer and cross your heart to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> this kid, she's so great. Where's her spinoff book? <laughs> no, but I love that, like, the singing the song is, like, to entice him, I guess, yes. to tell the truth. <laughs> this sounds like something I would say. <laughs> And then she goes, here goes. It took me a long time to make this song up, so I hope you like it. And the the boy said, oh, brother. And then she sings the song. And Bud says, in his head, not out loud because he's a good boy. Boy, that was about the worst song I'd ever heard. (laughs) Kim stood up and bowed like a princess. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I clapped my hands together kind of soft under the table. She said, thank you very much. Oh, I think that that I literally laughed out loud while oh, I was so reading. Good. I feel like we got to talk about these rules. Oh yes, they are the best. <laughs> Bud Caldwell's rules and things for having a funner life and making a better liar out of yourself. So I don't know about you, but I like straight up thought he had them all more or less written down somewhere. You know, so that because he was citing rule numbers. Hmm. Well, I thought the same thing because the very first rule that we get is rule and things number three. If you got to tell a lie, make sure it's simple and easy to remember. And I was like, okay, we're going to get like the top 10 list of rules. The second rule we get to is rules and things number 118. (laughs) And I was like, oh, I don't know if this is a real list. And if it is, is it all in his mind? Because he has very few possessions. He makes yeah. it very clear what it is that is in his suitcase that he carries around with him all the time. And it does not include <laughs> a list of rules. <laughs> a tome of rules. <laughs> it would be like an entire ream of paper. <laughs> well, I, so even about halfway through the book, I thought this is a real list that the order must have evolved organically from like his experiences. Mm-hmm. So then we get to rules and things number eight. Which is, whenever an adult tells you to listen carefully and talks to you in a real calm voice, do not listen. Run as fast as you can because something really terrible is just around the corner, especially if the cops are chasing you. (laughs) Which I was like, why is that number eight? I want to read a book that is his entire life. I would love 
just like a whole series that just goes through all of the adventures that this kid must have had in his life. Because just from these little glimpses we're continuously getting to his previous life, it's <laughs> it sounds fascinating. And where'd the rules the rules must have come from something, some experience mm-hmm. that we assume happened to him in real life. Until we get to about, uh, I don't know, this is the last quarter or the last third of the book. Mm-hmm. He's talking about a he's talking about a rule. Rule number sixty three is never ever say anything bad about someone you don't know, especially when you're around a bunch of strangers. You never can tell who might be kin to that person or who might be a lip flapping big mouth spy. <laughs> and then he says, I wasn't sure if this drummer guy really was a dirty dog or if he was just a big teaser. Whichever way, I had to work really hard on remembering rule and thing number sixty eight. Or was it sixty three? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, uh. These are arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. Oh, the numbers don't matter. They don't matter. I mean, I'm they sorry. seem to have some relative correlation to importance. I know you like your numbers and your lists. I'm sorry. If they're in a <laughs> list, if they're in an order, it feels like it should be some order generated by either experience or importance. I wonder if he just sort of has like makes these rules up as he goes. And then just generally thinks like, oh, that rule that I thought of around this time in my life and this time of my life was around the rule number 60s. So he's just like, oh, this was 63. You know what I mean? (laughs) Probably. I don't even think it is that specific. I think it's just like similar. I think it's just like, oh, that's something I learned. Yeah. Not that Mm. long ago. High number. (laughs) Oh, that's something I've known since day one. Low number. Yeah. Make sure your lie is easy to tell. As a narrative device, I love that they were just like peppered throughout the book because they were almost always comedic in like in like in not in like in an overt way, but in this like sort of nice little like for the audience way of like, look at <laughs> look at the rules that this child is living his life by and how it is directly affecting his life right now. And it does kind of like give you a little bit of glimpse into like an unsavory past at times. Like mm-hmm. He's talking about being chased by the cops. He's talking about being lied to and, and having all of these like really poor experiences like previous foster homes. But we don't really ever get him feeling like sorry for himself or being really, really negatively affected by any previous experience that he has. What did you think about the fact that he was the one that found his mother's body? And, well, I don't think she was – she wasn't dead when he found her, was she? Or she was? I okay. think so. Yeah. Well, he says he can't cry anymore. His eyes don't cry anymore, mm-hmm. which – was so painful mm-hmm. to read and we get that really early on like he's talking to the six-year-old at the home and the six-year-old wants to go to the same place that bud is going and he's not and he tries to cheer him up and he says like you'll be like a little baby to them they'll just mm-hmm. dress you up it'll be fine yeah page three. Oh, this was the third foster home i was going to and i'm used to packing up and leaving but it still surprises me that there are Always a few seconds, right after they tell you you've got to go, when my nose gets all runny and my throat gets all choky and my eyes get all stingy. But the tears coming out doesn't happen to me anymore. I don't know when it first happened, but it seems like my eyes don't cry no more. Mm. And I, (laughs) page three, I was like, oh boy, (laughs) this is going to be, (laughs) this is going to be a, its own kind of great depression as we read through it. But yeah, the rules, like, I think for me what makes them so fun is they're so accurate. Mm -hmm. Like a couple I straight up wrote amen next to. I think it's so funny. I can't remember if this was a rule, but you even even said at the beginning of this podcast that his mom had passed. And I almost made a comment then because I was like, oh, no, Carrie, she's dead. Yeah. (laughs) He makes a very strong point of of saying, like, why do people say that they passed or they're not here anymore? They're they're gone. gone. Yeah. That's a rule. Gone equals dead. Gone equals dead. And uh, it's true. You know, for a kid that has had death in his life, it's uh, it's definitely understandable that he is a little averse to people just not using the correct terminology. If a grown-up starts a sentence by saying, haven't you heard? Get ready, because what's about to come out of their mouth is going to drop you headfirst into a boiling tragedy. (laughs) So next to rules and things number 118, I wrote in all caps, so accurate. (laughs) You have to give adults something that they think they can use to hurt you by taking it away. That way, they might not take something away that you really do want. Unless they're crazy or real stupid, they won't take everything because if they did, they wouldn't have anything to hold over your head to hurt you with later. Mm. And I was like, game theory. (laughs) 100%. (laughs) 
that's it, man. Yeah. Ugh. I was so impressed by this little conversation that him and Bugs were having where they were having two separate conversations, but they were both like listening and reacting to the other, but then like turning it back to their own conversation. Bugs says, did you really beat that kid up in the foster home? I said, "Uh uh-huh. We kind of had a fight. How long does it take to get out west? Depends how many trains you got to hop. Was he really two years older than you? Uh Uh-huh. He was 12. Is it fun to hop a train? Some of the time it is. Some of the time it's scary. We heard it was kind of big, too. Was he? <laughs> what a great conversation. I love I love that they are both <laughs> carrying on on this, but they're, they're not sort of just talking about their own thing. They're just really genuinely reacting to the other yeah. person, but just having two simultaneous conversations. And I just was sitting here, like, wrapped reading this whole chapter just in awe. I was like, what a great dialogue that he's got going between these kids. I do that all the time yeah. where I'll talk to people and they're talking about something else and I'm not backing down and they're not backing down. And halfway through the conversation, I'll be like, this is not like how adults have a conversation. But I'm not going to stop talking about my thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's so good. Where it comes from. but <laughs> Mr. Curtis, I applaud you. So we have this kid who is kind of like wise beyond his years in a lot of ways, but is still like we're we're kind of reminded every once in a while that he's still a child. Yeah. And one of the things is that like he thinks this man is a vampire uh, yeah. who is coming to suck his blood. But the imagery of like an earlier conversation that he had, which is the the loose teeth story. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so he's he's worried because his teeth started to go loose and he didn't really have anyone in his life that could explain properly that that's normal and why it's normal. He was just told that like that happens sometimes and he gets terrified and then he says it shakes you up a whole lot more than grown folks think it does when perfectly good parts of your body commence to loosening up and falling off of you. (laughs) Unless you're stupid as a lamppost, you've got to wonder what's coming off next. Your arm? Your leg? Your neck? (laughs) Every morning when you wake up, it seems a lot of your parts aren't stuck on as good as they used to be. Ugh, it's so good. Yeah, he's talking about uh, being being six and how Jerry's so scared, you know, to go off to the other, to a new foster home. And he's like, I understand why he's scared. Being six is hard. (laughs) That's when your teeth fall out, man. Yeah. I mean, should we talk about this band and the fact, and just the whole ending? Yeah. I don't know where this fits in the conversation, but my favorite moment of like I exhaled and was like things gonna be okay (laughs) is when he unpacks his suitcase yeah at the very end Mm. right before he when he's trying to learn how to play the saxophone and he puts some of the rocks on Calloway's desk and he puts the picture out up on the wall that he has of his mother and the new picture he just got from uh Miss Thomas like up on the vanity and it's like He's unpacking. Like, he's not unpacked this whole book. He has literally carried the suitcase around, not let anybody touch it, gets so mad when it's opened, counts and recounts all the stuff in it. And then he unpacks. I don't know. Like, it was so moving. Well, Carrie, he's home now. He's home now. <laughs> the only part of the book I did not like mm-hmm. was the fact that no one ever asked him his mom's name oh. for, like, weeks, it seems like, or just a, a a long amount of time. He comments on that, too, because they because Herman says, would you say your mom's name was? And he said, I didn't. Yeah. So he similarly is like, you didn't ask me that. I guess it's nice. I guess like I, I think probably what the author is trying to portray is that like these people were good, kind hearted people that were going to take him in regardless. Well, Calloway seems to think that he is like after his money. Right. Like, but like the other band leaders or yeah. band members are so opening and welcoming to him that I th- I think that was the author's intent, and I could be wrong. It seems like he was like, well, I don't want I don't want it just to be that they took him in because he is blood. I want yeah. them to take him in because they love him. And I was like, but if a kid shows up on your doorstep and says, you are my father and I had a mother, wouldn't your first question be, who was your mother? Like, let me think if I slept with her. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) I guess I think that's like having that conversation would be some kind of admission that it's possible. And and not that that's an excuse, but that for me was enough to say that's why they didn't ask her or didn't ask Bud for his mother's name because Mm – 
yeah, it would have resolved a lot of conflict very quickly. But um, I think he didn't even want to dignify that potential reality with a response is sort yes. of what I gathered. Like he wasn't entertaining any aspect of Bud. It, it's one of those things like I can understand it. I think like there you can, you can make all these arguments for why it makes sense that it wasn't brought up. But at the end of the day, I just think it would have been. Yeah. <laughs> but like surprising. as a narrative piece, yeah. you know, like you're right. It would have taken away all of that sort of like getting to know the band and being accepted and like having this sort of like unspoken feud going with Herman who refuses to acknowledge the kid. Yeah. Um, we would have lost all of that. So I think it's understandable why he made that choice to to just leave that part until later. But it really, like, irked me when I was yeah. reading. I was like, just ask the kid whose mom is, you know? That's so funny. Or it could have been as simple as, like, what was your mom's name? It's like, I don't know. I'm a child. I don't yeah. know what my mom's name was. I was six. You know, like, yeah. that make, that it's I called her mom. Like, it, yeah. I feel like this could have been resolved in a different way that, that would have made more sense narratively. And then, like, maybe he shows the picture at the end. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my gosh, this is yeah. my daughter, you know? We talk about his mother being dead the whole book, and it's not something he ever, like, has to deal with, really deals with. Like, it just is a fact. It's a given circumstance. And so one of the major pieces of, like, resolution that we get is he gets talked to about it Mm -hmm. in a way that is concrete and understanding. And it's not for his grief, but it's comparing his experiences to what she uh, Miss Thomas and her Herman are feeling. She said, Bud, we've got a problem I'm going to need your help with. Uh-oh, which is a rule we've learned earlier. Mm-hmm. You said you were, it usually means you have to go get something. <laughs> <laughs> you go like fetch something. Yeah. You said you were six years old when your mom died. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that was four years ago. Yes, ma'am. You can remember how bad you felt when you first knew she was gone, can't you? Yes, ma'am. And then he's thinking, because it feels the same. Mm. <sighs> yeah, which of course it does. But for him, he's never concretely admitted that to himself or to us, that he feels just as bad today as he did four years ago when he found his mom. Mm-hmm. And she says, well, you've had four years to try and heal that scar, but it still hurts some of the time, doesn't it? Sometimes a lot. I know, bud. But remember, your grandfather and I just found out she passed. The hurt is brand new for us. Miss Thomas started swallowing. It's like, and then she tells him to be patient. And what she does uh, when he first arrives and says, we've never had a kid around here before, so you're going to have to be patient with us learning. And then as soon as he brings this news of Angela dying, she asks him to be patient with them again, which I think is such a kind instruction to give a kid. Like when you empower a kid in that way to say, like, I need you to be patient with me, the adult. Like it totally... Mm -hmm just like makes you stand up a little bit straight and you're like, yeah, adult, I'll be patient <laughs> for you. Adult that needs patience. Yeah. There are a lot of really powerful moments yeah. in this book. Are you crying? I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It's so beautiful. And like I said, it ends with that line about, you know, the importance of talking to your parents and your grandparents and and that you carry them with you just like he did the suitcase and – and you can make them immortal by continuing to tell their stories. And mm-hmm. It's just so nice. Yeah. Really well done. Yeah. Christopher Paul Curtis. Uh, I hate to skip my favorite uh, section, the illusion of life, oh. but I feel like we don't really need it for this one because of all the rules. Because we, I, <laughs> Carrie, I thought the same thing. Yeah. I did not pick one because I was like, the illusion for life are Bud Caldwell's rules and things for having a funner life and making a better liar out of yourself. Yeah. I like that the subtitle that is making a better liar out of yourself, but it really is understanding human nature. <laughs> yeah. There's only a couple of them that really talk about lying. Yeah. Which, as a kid who's been jostled around from foster home to foster home, is totally understandable. I'm yeah. not upset about it. But, it, you know, we he, he kind of moves away from that the later the rules yeah. come. It's not as much about lying as it is just about, like, understanding the world and your place yeah. in it. Yeah. They're so good. So we'll skip that and we'll go mm. straight to the ratings. Uh, what would you give this book, Carolyn? I give it six <laughs> exclamation points. That's the first one I'm giving it. And it earned every single every one. one of them. It earned all the exclamation points. Oh, it was so uh, good. That was a, the real band name yeah. of her gra- of his uh, grandfather. Yeah. It's just, just so great. Which totally 
makes more sense now because like it sort of felt like a little cheeky and cute and then I was like oh that's straight up like what they were called yeah. like of course <laughs> yeah of course bring that over what a nice what a nice part oh man okay well if I don't give it the six exclamation points no you can then, that's appropriate <laughs> then oh I'll you got give another it one the I give it three weeks to to be a musical prodigy yeah <laughs> Oh, bud. Oh, well, thank you so much, Carolyn Burns, for joining me again. You're welcome, Carrie. It's a new decade. I know. It's a brand new decade. Brand new decade. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. See you later. Thanks so much for listening. Join the conversation and tell us what you thought about the book on Facebook.com slash Newberry Report. That's N-E-W-B-E-R-Y Report. And at Newberry Report on Twitter. And never miss a show by making sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and all your favorite podcast apps. You can also find our show and some other terrific podcasts at www.racecarradio.com. The Newberry Report is hosted and recorded by me, Carrie Caston. My co-host is Carolyn Burns. It was edited by Austin Cologne. Our executive producer is David Hoffman. The Newberry Report is a production of Race Car Radio. Race Car Radio is a division of Citizen Race Car. We tell stories.